and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this Saturday night, AEW will broadcast the second edition of All Out from Daly's Place Amphitheater in Jacksonville, Florida. In what's shaping up to be one of the biggest shows of the year, we have three world championship titles on the line, a 21-man casino battle royale, as well as some wildly entertaining matchups across the board. There's a lot to cover today. Uh, we have about 45 minutes or so, so let's dispense with the opening remarks, and Tony's ready to go. So if we're all ready to go, let's go right away to the lines. And uh, Robin, if you'd open the line to uh, Kenny McIntosh from Inside the Ropes, and we'll get, we'll get started. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Very well, Kenny. Great to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. We're all very excited uh, all out this Saturday. I wanted to ask you, maybe it's a controversial question, I hope not, but um, Chris Jericho had said, I think it was last weekend, that he didn't really think that the, the FTW belt meant that much in AEW so far. Um, I just kind of wanted to get your comments. And obviously, there's kind of three male single titles and what we can maybe expect coming up with the FTW title to, to give it more. The FTW title will be treated totally differently than the other titles. I'm really glad you asked that, Kenny. Uh, I'm working on a pilot, and it's a different kind of a project than the way you've seen wrestling titles uh, defended traditionally. And it's very different from, obviously, how we use the World Heavyweight title and the, the TNT title. So the AEW World title and the TNT title, I, I think, have been treated as very, very important titles, and I, I really, really feel great about both those belts and their champions. And the FTW, you know, title and Brian Cage, I feel good about too, but it, we haven't totally established it yet. And to be honest, our plans for the FTW title, uh, there's a lot in store, and I'm excited about it. So I'm glad you asked. Thanks, Kenny. All right, thanks, Kenny. Uh, next up, I'm going to call on Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone. Bill, you there? Hey, can you hear me? We can. Oh, hey. Hey, Tony, how are you? I'm well, Bill. Thanks, man. It's great to hear from you. So I wanted to get your opinion on the response to the tooth and nail match so far. Um, I know some people online were less than thrilled that it's going to be on the buy-in. So do you have any comment just to reassure fans or make them realize that this is an opportunity for them and for more people to see the all-out pay-per-view, and it's not really a demotion? That's absolutely true. I've always felt that way, and we put from the first uh, pay-per-view we did, Double or Nothing, we put some of our biggest stars, including Hangman and MJF, on the buy-in. And uh, the idea of it, the reason it's called the buy-in is because we try and put exciting stuff on this first you know, hour of the show so that people will pay to see the whole show. Um, I love wrestling fans, and I've often said that wrestling is my favorite economy, and it is a strange, inelastic economy. It is the only place in the world where you'll have people complaining about getting something for free uh, that they don't have to pay $50 for, and I think that's great uh, because, like, the prestige of the quarterly pay-per-views, it shows how important I think we made getting on the main card. But at the same time, this is a great, important match for us I'm not, I think you'll see a lot more of Britt and Big Swole, and uh, I'm excited about this. This isn't going to be uh, a traditional wrestling match. The pay-per-view is going to be very, very wrestling-heavy and not as story-heavy. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk more on this call about it, but philosophically, like uh, last night, the second hour was more story-based stuff to get you ready for the pay-per-view. Uh, you know, similar to what we did for Revolution uh, we had a very wrestling heavy first hour in Kansas City with uh, Kenny Omega and Pac in the Iron Man match. And the second hour was more story stuff. And Chris uh, Jericho and John Moxley did the weigh in. Last night was some great wrestling in the first uh, hour and some good wrestling in the second hour, too, I thought. Uh, particularly uh, Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb were excellent. But uh, with Britain Swole, uh, it, there's like so, going to be a ton of great wrestling on this card. Their match is going to be uh, cinematic frankly, and it's going to be great. We're going to have a live crowd there. And uh, we thought for the live crowd, given the kind of match they're going to have in this situation, this isn't the, 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 the Britain Swole can and will have great wrestling matches. I think this will be a little bit different, but it's also going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be free for everybody to check out. And I think all the great wrestling everybody's going to get uh, on the pay-per-view will be worth the money. But it's a great question. I don't think it uh, affects the status of the match. It's more about the tone of the match, frankly, 
and uh, and also the fact that it's good placement. It's a good advertisement for broad uh, fans to AEW. We think it's going to be a great match, and it's going to be going out to a big audience. All right. Th- thanks, Bill. Um, next up, I'd like to call on Connor Casey from Comic Book. Connor, are you there? Connor, you have to unmute your line. Hey, Connor. Hey, are we good? Yeah, man. Awesome. Hey, Tony, thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, Of course, uh, yeah. In the past few weeks, we have seen uh, NWA power footage on Dynamite. We've heard Billy Corgan's voice. And obviously, we've seen Thunder Rosa more than a few times, and she's got this big match on Saturday. What is the working relationship between AEW and NWA as it stands right now? It's the working relationship between us is the extent of the good personal relationship between Billy Corgan and me. Uh, I've had a good relationship with Billy for years, long before I got into the wrestling business. Um, frankly, uh, I'm good friends with Chris Nowinski. Uh, I really believe in Chris's work. And uh, I think, you know, the Concussion Legacy Foundation does great work. Chris has come in at my request and spoken to all of the AEW talent. And uh, we have a good relationship with the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And Chris is my good friend. And uh, he introduced me to Billy years ago. And I went to one of Billy's concerts. He's a very nice guy. And I have a lot of respect for Billy as a musician. Uh, the NWA has got great history. They aren't really operating right now. I think we're very, very different companies in a very different place. And I think the NWA, it sounds like they're going to get back to running. And I wish Billy the best with the stuff he's doing. And I thought this would be a good opportunity for them and for us because Thunder Rose is great. And I thought she would be a great challenger for Sheeta. So it's one of those situations where uh, I thought it would make sense for both sides, which is why I proposed it. And he agreed, and that's why we're doing it. Thanks, but, uh It's a good question, that Connor. I, I, I'm sorry, Jim. I was I, I didn't mean to. So it's that, that's the that's it, Connor. And uh, I, you know, I've asked Billy about this. Uh, I'm not sure what what the future would hold for it, but obviously, um, if Thunder Rosa wins the title, there could be a lot more. And uh, Thunder Rosa and Sheeta is going to be one of the great matches on the card. I think Thunder Rosa. Her first match on Dynamite was a hit last night, and uh, I'm really excited for the match. And so Billy and I have got a good relationship. If Thunder Rosa wins the title, uh, you could see, obviously, uh, a lot more stuff between us. But um, I don't have any plans to use anybody else from the NWA. Um, Although some of our star wrestlers have been there, you know, with uh, Eddie Kingston and Ricky Starks and Colt Cabana. So it's a good it's a good question, but besides Thunder Rosa, we're not really talking about using anybody else from there. But again, Thunder Rosa by you know the weekend could be our champion, and it's quite possible. So I would stay tuned on that. All right, thanks Tony, and thanks Connor. Um, we we asked uh, we invited everyone to submit questions also online, and we have a number of them. Uh, Tony, I'd like to read one uh, now to you from Darren Paltrowitz a freelancer, his question is, unlike other wrestling companies, AEW has managed to keep people surprised where most of the surprise appearances have been kept secret even when pre-taped. Does a lot of work go into that, or is it that people don't get hired unless they really know or or really show trustworthiness? Um, I think it's a bit of both. We work really hard at it. We keep a small circle we're a small company. It's a family co- business, a, a small company, and we're a startup. And we've grown so quickly worldwide. But uh, frankly, even though we're the second biggest wrestling company in the world, uh, we're not the biggest machine. We're not the biggest. Uh, the, there's not so many people that, that just spoil a surprise because I think uh, the more people that are in on it, the more likely it is. And we really benefit that we got a lot of great, trustworthy people in our front office. And uh, I keep things very close to the vest, uh, frankly. But the people I do talk to, I really trust. And the people we bring in have been really trustworthy. So I think it's been a, a really positive thing for us. And we've, we've tried to keep these surprises a surprise. And frankly, we have a lot more surprises ahead for you in the coming weeks. Um, and I'm excited about things, things that are coming. So uh, 
I really respect the job our, our team have done and the, the rare times things have come out. Um, I don't think they were from people in our core organization. Uh, it's funny, Chris, I think at one point alluded, Jericho alluded to somebody uh, he thought mentioned something off a tape show. And I think he was right. And I don't think that was a person that works here. Uh, but generally when we've uh, tried to keep surprises, we've kept them in the family and we have, a, we have a great family here. Fantastic. Thanks for, Thanks for, for that, Darren. Uh, we're going to open the lines back open uh, and go to Nick Hausman from Wrestling Inc. Nick, are you, are you with us? I am here. Hey, Nick. Hi, Tony. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Sure, Nick. How's the weather in Chicago? Sorry for asking uh, that and wasting everyone's time. I'll add that time back on the end like a, like a football match. You know, <laughs> I went down to North Pond yesterday, and it was a beautiful 82 degrees. I watched the turtles and the ducks, and it was really – it was beautiful. <laughs> should have been there, buddy. It was wonderful. I mean, it's been a while. I haven't been home uh, up there in a, a long time uh, yeah. since Revolution. Since Revolution. Come on back. We'll go to a hair salon and a bar. It'll be wonderful. Uh, <laughs> What's up, Nick? <laughs> um, so, Tony, my question is pretty straightforward. I know you love when you get asked about free agents. It's like your favorite thing. Um, but there's a big one out there right now. Brock Lesnar. Have you talked to Brock? Do you have interest in Brock? Um, what do you say to all the, the speculation that he could possibly find his way into AEW? I can't comment uh, on that at this time, Nick, uh, but um, I've enjoyed uh, Brock's work for many years. Uh, he's a great fighter and a great wrestler. Uh, I don't think people talk enough about what a great worker Brock Lesnar is and, and uh, is one of the great working big men I've ever seen, one of the great uh, athletes in the history of the wrestling business, and I have so much respect for him. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't uh, comment on that, Nick, but I appreciate you asking. Thanks, Nick. Um, another question came in online, Tony, for you from John Corrigan from the Wrestling Estate. With all the highs and lows of AEW's tenure so far, what has been the biggest lesson you've learned as the head of a pro wrestling company? It's a great question. Uh, last night is a really good example, honestly. There's times uh, where the red light goes on and it's 7.59.59 and at 8 o'clock, the show clicks on and you should have realized something sooner, but literally it doesn't occur to you until you're there in the chair. And that was me last night. And, and there's times where it's going to be like this. And, and frankly, like uh, I know last night there was, a, there was a lot of great wrestling in the first hour. And I put a lot of responsibility on Thunder Rosa and Serena to have the strong wrestling match in the second hour. And I thought they nailed it and they were put in a showcase position in the semifinal and they nailed it. And, uh, but I kind of knew we were putting a lot on them and thankfully they hit a home run for us. But in the first hour, like I said, in Kansas city in the first hour last night in the go home shows, my philosophy has been put a lot of wrestling there, put a lot of story stuff in the second half. Now in Kansas city, some of the story stuff you got in the second half, the way in with Jericho and Moxley with, you know, this big crowd in Kansas City, they loved it. You've got uh, the um, uh, Orange Cassidy's coming out and challenging Pac in the show uh, with making that match. It's a lot of fun stuff. Last night, uh, frankly, I understood that, like, if people want to see a lot of wrestling in the show, 48 weeks a year, that's all I think about is wrestling, wrestling, wrestling four times a year when we have these huge, huge pay-per-view cards, they that week become the priority. The go-home shows, I treat them differently. The highs and lows and the lessons I've learned, every week I learn a new lesson. The pandemic has been lesson after lesson after lesson. I try to learn things and not do them again. And if I make a mistake twice, then I'm definitely trying not to make it three times. Uh, it's the highs and lows, it's really the same thing. It's just like learning and, and trying to put together good shows. I have a feeling that this weekend is going to be one of the great highs. Um, I look back at Revolution as probably a high point for us. And then uh, I just think like that day was a perfect day for me. Um, I had met with a lot of people. I had been with uh, Orange Cassidy and Pac talking, you know, separately and uh, very late talking about things that I wanted to see tomorrow. And I'd been with uh, John Moxley and Chris Jericho very, very late separately uh, talking about things that were going to happen with them. And uh, I ended up uh, getting very little sleep. Uh, we played 
uh, early in the morning, Fulham won. Uh, when I say weave, I mean Fulham. Uh, Fulham had this match. I didn't get a lot of sleep and then went over straight to the arena and we had revolution. And to me, it's the best thing we've ever done. It was just the perfect day. I would call it the ultimate high, but it was also the culmination of learning a lot of lessons. Since then, uh, the wrestling business has changed dramatically. Last year, we were the number one company in attendance per show in the world of wrestling. And uh, this year, it's not really about trying to put fans into arenas. The, the philosophy of the business has changed completely in the last six months. And I feel like we've tried to roll with the punches. This weekend is going to be one of the highs. This weekend, I can't tell you how excited I am for Saturday. I held back in the second hour last night too much, maybe, because I wanted you to really anticipate the wrestling on this show because the main card on Saturday, bell to bell, is going to be the best wrestling you've seen since the pandemic. Furthermore, I hate that it's come to this. I hate that this is what we have to do. But I've used this analogy privately and publicly, and I'm sorry to give such a long-winded answer about highs and lows. There's a lot of answers to highs and lows and a lot of things I can talk about. And I'll say this, like the pandemic has been the, the, the best example of this. There have been such highs and lows in this pandemic uh, trying to do great things. To come back and do Double or Nothing and do that, I thought Double or Nothing was like the bastion of ingenuity. To be able to sit back and it's like, okay, we, you know, with what we have, how can we do a great pay-per-view? I thought, and I'm sorry, I'll just be honest. We were both operating during the pandemic. I tested everybody coming in. This might be the pull-out quote of the press conference, but I'm going to say it. I thought Double or Nothing kicked the crap out of WrestleMania. It was a much better pay-per-view. Uh, we were both operating under difficult circumstances. I think ours, we were fortunate. It was a little bit later in the pandemic, and we had implemented testing, and we're doing testing at that time. But when we did Double or Nothing, we were still the only ones doing testing. So it wasn't like, uh, it, you know, we, were, we, were, we had a good testing plan at that point, okay? And what we came out with and did at that point uh, to, to set up a bubble uh, and do that pay-per-view, I was so proud of it. We've come a long way since Double or Nothing. Uh, if you were, dis you know, if you, if you uh, want to see a show with wrestling fans in a packed arena, I can't give that to you right now. But what, what, what I can give you, and I've talked a lot about in the last week or two, has been a drive-in movie theater. I know everybody wants to go back to the movies and go see, me, at least I do. I used to go to the movies all the time since I was a kid and, and it, you know, it's one of my releases. And I haven't obviously been able to go to the cinema in a really long time, but the drive-in movie uh, is a way to go with your friends and family and feel safe and do the same thing you used to do before, which is go see a new movie together and, and you know, in a kind of a captive experience where everyone's not going to be in their phones and, and paying attention to the movie on the big screen. And I, I, I can't offer you the cinema, but I can offer you the drive-in movie. And that's how I feel about what we're doing with the live events. And it's one of the great highs for me. And uh, to see the live crowd, Chris Jericho described it as one of the great highs of his 30-year storybook career uh, last week, having that crowd back. We're going to go... We're going to, we're going to go, we've got a lot of unallocated space we didn't use, but we didn't want to stretch the security personnel, the, the people, the staff at Daly's Place and the AEW team have done such an amazing job on this. And, and we're going to go a little bit closer to 15% uh, for all out. And again, I compare it to the drive-in movie theater. I think this is 99, over 99% safer uh, than the experience of packing people into an arena. I think this is the only way uh, to do live event wrestling shows right now is outdoor, uh, socially distanced, seating pods, fans in protective masks, and having people around, not to, not to be a jerk about it, but just to remind people, hey, please don't get out of your pod and go hang out with the people in the other pods, and please keep your mask on when you're not sipping your drink or eating your pretzel or, you know, so um, we've had, we've had that. And uh, this weekend will be, I believe uh, one of the all time highs in the company. When you look at the card, which, you know, I think now we can hopefully spend more time talking about. And I, rather than me giving you this long winded answer, I just, I'm really excited for it. I, I think Saturday all out, uh, it's going to be a lot different than all out last year, but uh 
I wouldn't have it any other way for the situation we're in, the people I'm with. Uh, please, if, if you ever liked an AEW show, check out All Out this weekend because I think it will be some of our strongest work. Thanks for putting up with that. Sorry. Again. <laughs> we're all good. <laughs> um, let's go back to the live lines. Uh, John Alba from Spectrum Sports. John, are, are you there? Yes, I am. Tony, thank you for taking the call. I appreciate your time. Uh, piggybacking off of what you just said about the COVID protocols, at what point did you guys decide that you were going to let fans in? And what was the process like in determining what the health protocols would look like? We came up with this idea. I wanted to do this, anything I could in, to, to start looking at a safe way eventually when we've got you know, first of all, first and foremost was a testing plan. We shut the company down in April until we could come up with a way to make it safe to do shows for the wrestlers again. So we did that. And my, my number one priority at A and B are wrestler uh, health and safety and fan health and safety. So we came in and it's like first to do a wrestling show. We need to make sure we can do this and keep the wrestlers and the crew and staff safe. So we implemented a testing plan and we returned uh, at the beginning of May with a live show and, and have been doing this with, you know, testing and, and have had great results, which really shows that the people have been doing the right things and social distancing because we've had, uh, I think, you know, people ha have come in and we've had very, very few positive cases and we do rigorous testing. Uh, once we got that implemented, uh, I started to look at how we could utilize our outdoor space to safely have some kind of live event experience. And we'd been, we'd been putting, tested people you know fans uh, at ringside but they weren't really fans they were wrestlers and crew and staff but it, it added a sense of normalcy you've probably heard me say it by now that i got this idea from watching the tonight show and they had the crew in the studio and uh i you know going back during the first week of the pandemic looking at how shows were handling it that was the most creative thing i'd seen and uh then how can i kind of take that and replicate it. How can we do this? Well, Daily Place has three levels and is a really big outdoor space. Uh, eventually, we had had, you know, the staff kind of spaced out in the bowl, and I started to wonder about the top two bowls. There, there's not a bad seat in the house as far as the stuff we've allocated. I mean, we've, you know, there's great views, and it's, uh, you know, my, my first thought was, how, is it for egress, for getting people into the building, temperature testing, all the, the things you need to do, the, the things I never thought of uh, that our marketing staff put together, like the pickup uh, of the, uh, you know, when people have ordered uh, items uh, online for, you know, shop AEW, they're, they're able to pick them up, which I never even thought of how we'd get through that or the concession lines and the creative thought and ingenuity that our team put into it uh, we spent the last several months working on it. And then we did kind of a soft open. We invited some staff uh, and some sponsors and local friends to come and sit up there and, uh, you know, did temperature tests. All the stuff we're doing now for them is kind of a soft open. We slowly started to hire more security personnel. Then uh, a week before we went live with fans, uh, we had done, again, kind of a soft open. We had brought in some security I and mean, I think you saw some of those videos, maybe some of you guys had posted online of what we were doing before we actually started selling tickets just to kind of get ready to train the security personnel to remind people to stay in their pods and, and keep their masks on or, uh, you know, not too many people going into the bathrooms at once. And um, it's, it's, it's been a process that, you know, it, it felt slow because everyone was anxious to have the fans back. But I think it was right to be cautious. And, and now we got a process that has worked really well, we think, and hopefully for all out, it'll be, it'll pay off with this, with this great crowd of, you know, 700 people, 750 people. It, however it comes out exactly, it's going to be the hottest, biggest crowd for wrestling in a long time. And the most important thing is it'll be a safe crowd. Um, thanks for asking about it. All right. Th thanks, John. Um, like to call on Jim Barcelona from the Miami, Miami Herald. Hey, Jim. Okay, all right, good. Oh, yeah, now you can hear me. Great. Hey, thank you so much. 
you know, I'm curious because you mentioned Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb. I'm wondering about Serena Deeb and and your women's division in general. And might we be seeing more Serena on the show? And just you had a, a great women's tag team cup tournament that was just uh, amazing. And what are your thoughts of the division these days and also about Serena? And thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we've been bringing in more talent. Uh, some of our best wrestlers in the division, including our first champion, Rio, have been uh, trapped outside the U.S. because of the pandemic. Uh, Yuka Sakazaki was also one of our top wrestlers. And so not having them, we've been looking to bring in more talent. And uh, Thunder Rosa challenging Sheeta for the championship. And, and now Thunder Rosa being positioned here with a chance to be a top wrestler and maybe even the face of our women's division. And then you've got uh, Serena Deeb, who many of us are familiar with uh, from her work in the straight edge society for WWE. And uh, I hadn't seen Serena work in a long time. I heard she had been looking really good in the ring and uh, she came in and uh, I thought she was really impressive and she got frankly rave reviews and, and uh, I'd love to have Serena back. And, Again, Thunder Rosa versus Sheeta, we're very excited about on Saturday at All Out. And that's why we've been looking to expand and bring more talent in. The Women's Tag Team Cup, we brought in more talent. Tay Conti uh, and Anna Jay were a good team. And now the Dark Order has been recruiting Tay Conti. And we think that could be uh, interesting to see where that goes. So, yeah, because of the pandemic we thought we had some some very good uh women wrestlers that were a really important part of the division and with them not being here hopefully they'll be back soon and that's why we've looked to bring in some new talent who i think have really done well especially in recent weeks thanks for joining us jim um next up is amy oh, wait, wait. Just, if I can, jim if i can for both jims just real quick jim if it's okay you know again I am really proud of them. I'm proud of Thunder Rosa and Serena because we put them in a big position in the semi to be the strongest wrestling match in the second hour, and they did it, and they hit a home run where the other matches are more, and you know we're setting up stories for All Out because All Out, like I said, even you know four weeks a year, I, these quarterly pay per views will really, frankly, you know beat the audience over the head and over this, especially in the second hour with All Out. But it's for a reason because I want you to know that this Saturday. We're going to do something really, really special. I'm, I'm so excited about it, but I'm really proud of uh, Thunder Rosa and Serena because they, they hit a home run in the second hour. So thanks for asking about that because I thought they were, they were great. Okay. Um, Amy, you may have heard me uh, call on you. Amy and Emily, are, are you there? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, so this question is for Tony. What's it like being a wrestling fan who's now in charge of one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world? Are you still a fan? Has it changed your relationship with wrestling at all as you've worked through the last year and a half? Uh, yes, it's changed my relationship with wrestling uh, immensely. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things in the world. I've learned so much on the job, and that's what I was talking about last night. You sit down in the chair and you realize things sometimes that you'd, you'd pace things differently or do things differently. Uh, I've been through some of the most hectic situations of my life, but uh, it's one of my favorite things, and I am so happy to be in it. I have surreal moments all the time. Like, anytime I do a podcast or anything with Tony Schiavone, um, you know, I look over and I think it's ridiculous that, you know, Tony Schiavone, who I've been listening to my whole life, that I worked this closely with, uh, you know, whether it's producing him on the show uh, or on this podcast or in post-production, uh, Tony does all this great work. Uh, it makes me so happy when I think back to Tony Schiavone telling the story, you know, I've listened to his podcast before there was AEW, before I knew I was starting AEW. And, uh, he would talk about how, you know, he had regrets in the wrestling business. And one of his great regrets was leaving the WWF and he had this job that was a pretty good job and he left it to go back to WCW. He, re he thought he made a mistake and there were parts of the job he really liked. He really liked working at Coliseum video. He liked being a producer and he liked doing the announcing, but I don't think, 
I think the most organized he'd ever seen the operation in terms of production, in terms of producing the announcers and, and what they were looking for was probably the WWF. And I don't think they had as much structure in WCW. I hope and strive to be somewhere in between uh, where we're not overproducing the announcers, but I do feel like I've got a really good working beat with all the announcers. And I bring Tony up specifically because throughout the year he's been with us. And uh, even through the, you know, the darkest days of the pandemic through the shutdown, when we ran a bunch of tape shows in April and, and got it all together in a marathon, Tony was such a workhorse in post-production. And so I, I, I bring him up, not exclusively. I have these experiences all the time as I sit in gorilla, you know, with Dean Malenko and Jerry Lynn working through the matches, but I also don't really have any time to think about it because it's so hectic and crazy. But every day, you know, I share, uh, uh, you know, an office and a meeting space with, uh, you know, Chris Jericho, um, or Matt Hardy, it's pretty surreal. And to think that Chris Jericho and Matt Hardy uh, are going to be in very, very prominent matches on All Out makes me really smile. But I also can't really be biased or think of it that way. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I'm really, really excited for this weekend. And, and things like All Out and shows like All Out are what get me going. Um, I'm also really excited for this, just this whole week because I know that the, the dynamite after all out is going to be really, really good. I can't tell you guys everything about it yet because uh, you're going to have to see the pay-per-view and see what happens on the pay-per-view. And, uh, and, you know, there'll be some fun surprises, but this whole next week I'm really, really excited about. And uh, as a, that's as a fan and also as what I do professionally, that this is one of my great loves, my great love. Um, thanks for asking. Tony, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Alex McCarthy from Talk Sport, who wrote in. Alex's question is, how has picking up new talent like FTR affected the long-term booking they've often, or you've often spoken about? Have you enjoyed the challenge of pivoting? Uh, I have. I have. It's been crazy. Uh, like, when as we've added people, you do have to change plans. And at the same time, there's some people that come in and they make it very easy for you to change your plans. And when you get top talent like FTR, who are one of the best teams, if not the best tag team in the world, uh, they fit into your plans. Like, you know, it's like, it fits like a glove. Um, when you want to have the best tag team division in the world, you can't go wrong when you sign arguably the best tag team in the world and pair, you know, pair them in a division with a lot of the other candidates for the best tag team in the world, including Kenny and Hangman, including the Young Bucks. I thought Kenny and Hangman and the Young Bucks set the standard for American tag team wrestling this year and, and pretty, you know, going back a pretty, pretty long time uh, with their match at Revolution. And FTR versus Kenny and Hangman now, uh, they have to try and set the, reach that bar, and I'm excited to see if they can live up to it, but I also think there's a great chance they can. And uh, as far as bringing out other new people and pivoting, I really appreciate you asking this because I never thought we'd be in this situation. It was kind of a dream situation in terms of being able to like hone your craft, uh, being in Atlanta with, you know, less than 30% of your roster and trying to put together shows and having them make sense and not knowing whether you're doing four shows or five shows or six or how long it's going to be that you need to stretch these tapes and all the things you need to think of to get through that, um, that we got through the month of April is like, you know, if ever you can pivot around and, and make it work and piece together uh, shows and, and then come out stronger and, and do really well in May. And, and I was so worried about double or nothing and how we were going to do double or nothing and make it a great show. And we did. So if ever there have been, you know, questions about how to get people in and, and pivot uh, your ideas when you sign new people and, or people or the flip side, frankly, man, is it's that much harder when people aren't there. Uh, you know, fight, go into fight for the fallen. Uh, when we had some changes to fighter fest, it wasn't uh, exactly as we were originally thinking of doing it, but it worked out incredibly well. I thought under the circumstances and all the shows did really good numbers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun, but it's a lot easier when you have to pivot because you sign 
great new talent like FTR as opposed to when you have to pivot because, you know, people aren't available in the pandemic. So um, I think we're, we're, we've had unique experiences that have helped us, helped us do it. Um, there's an expression I saw somebody use on Twitter. This is very anecdotal and I hope, uh, I, you know, I hope it's, it's, it's okay. Somebody used the expression, the COVID push. I was like, man, that is a harsh expression, but it is frankly a thing that in the pandemic, when based on availability, there are people that have really stepped up and that that's what they got. And there are people that have made the most of it, not just in w, not just in AEW, also in WWE and any places that have been wrestling. Now New Japan's back up and you push the people you got and we're seeing people trying to be creative and, and do the best they can with what they got. I thought double or nothing with a hand we were dealt and what, what we had to build it up and then coming back May 6th. And then we'd already kind of put in the first layer of the house, some foundation setting up Cody versus Lance Archer in the TNT tournament, and then implementing other stories and reintegrating some of the people you'd only seen on video packages or promos for like the past five or six weeks. Uh, that was uh, a challenge going into double or nothing. So anyway, for all out, point being, uh, now that we have this great roster, I thought Double Nothing was hard to get to. This um, card, to me, when you look at the matches on this, I think having live fans, this has a chance to be a really, really special pay-per-view. And uh, it wasn't as daunting a task to get this card together in a lot of ways. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, we'll go back to the lines now. Um, call on Sean Radigan from PW Torch. Sean, you there? Yeah. Hi, Tony. How are you? I'm really I'm a great, Sean. It's great to hear from you. It's good to talk to you. Um, uh, I had a quick question. Uh, what was your thought process behind putting together the card for All Out this year? Um, I know earlier you talked a little bit about putting on a cinematic experience for fans um because of the pandemic and what's going on for people watching at home but a, a lot of stipulation matches up and down the card did the pandemic influence any of that thought process i don't think so. i you know there are stipulations there's a on the buy-in that's one of the reasons why i think having the cin the cinematic because there's not really the show is not going to be cinematic i think for the live event experience this is going to be it's not going to be a packed or arena full of fans, but there's fans here safely distanced and, and it's going to be a live show with fans and putting the cinematic match on the pre-show because that's the, the, you know, there are reasons we needed to do it. Uh, and it was the, the tone and, and the situation. And frankly, this is Brit's leg, Brit's leg injury is not like a worked injury. It's not like MJF's neck, like Brit had a broken leg and a broken nose. Uh, so with a fracture in her leg and her nose injury, like we gave her some, some time off. And this is the first time Britt's come back and done anything physical. Last night when she attacked Swole was the first time Britt's done a physical wrestling activity in a long time. And uh, I'm really excited for this match, but uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think it's, it's the right reason to do it cinematic, frankly. And, and for the people asking, I think that's why. For the wrestling on the show, there are some stipulation matches, but there's also just a lot of great wrestling. And I think when you look at it bell to bell, uh, even though there's, there's going to be obviously uh, Mimosa Mayhem, I think will be a great match. And Chris and Orange Cassidy have had a few great straight wrestling matches on television now and really great uh, examples of, of chain wrestling and, and, and the art of the comeback. This will be the most fans they've worked in front of. And this is going to be a great match. Uh, Matt Hardy and Sammy, is a, the broken rules effectively it's a last man standing loser leaves town match that applies to matt and uh matt and sammy have had uh this great feud there's a great story that sammy wants matt out of AEW. really since matt's been in AEW, he's he's mostly tormented sammy and, and vice versa so uh sammy's an original he is the original he wrestled in the first ever singles match in AEW. he wrestled the first ever match on dynamite and, you know, he's wrestling now uh, in our first last man standing match. He was in our first tables match. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. And if you look at the rest of the card, you got a casino battle royale, which also uh, is involving a lot of people on the card, but I think will be 
frankly, a great example of how far the roster's come since our first show, because I think this Casino Battle Royale, now that we have this depth of a roster, we'll see a lot more talent in it, and you'll see that the roster's come a long, long, long way. Uh, who's in this one versus where we were with the first Casino Battle Royale. We had some great people in it with MJF and Hangman. Uh, we established some new talent like Orange Cassidy in it, and but there were a lot of people in it who probably were not at the level of wrestling that are going to be in this one. And then I'd like to just go down the rest of the card because I feel like, Sean, there's so much good bell to bell wrestling. And for a person who just wants to see great wrestling matches, when you look at Young Bucks versus Jurassic Express, who are two of our top teams and they're both in the top five. And I think we really believe in the tag team wrestling. And it's like a title eliminator in UFC or boxing because they're both highly ranked and the winner of the match will be better positioned for a championship match. Uh, with the winner of Hangman and Kenny versus FTR, another great wrestling match that we, we think will have a chance to steal the show. Sheeta versus Thunder Rosa. Uh, I'm very, very excited for this as a bell-to-bell wrestling match again. Um, and then, of course, Moxley versus MJF will be, I think, a really, really strong wrestling match on this card. And I think, uh, you know, when you look at that, uh, that has a chance to really be a great chance to establish uh, whether it's going to be John's run of dominance or whether it's going to be that Max is the future of this company. And frankly, I think it's both. I think John's had such a great run as a champion, but I also think Max is arguably the future of this company. And I'm really excited for everybody to see what we're going to do here and how we're going to, how this match is going to go. I'm really excited for both of them because I think uh, as far as like a big fight feel, this has it to me. I'm, I'm really excited for their match. Uh, and I think I'm really excited to see, you know, how people come out of this with the show. There's also the eight man tag. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. I thought how Brody Lee uh, won the championship was a very, very, very strong moment for us and got a big response and, and shocked a lot of people. Um, the dark order again, when we, like, like, what I said with the Casino Battle Royale, I think as an organization, as a, as a group of heels, they've come very far from where they were last year. And Brody Lee has a chance to be a great TNT champion. I think the TNT championship means more in our company than other titles outside of the world title in other wrestling companies, if that makes sense. There's a reason there is a TNT champion. We have this media relationship that means so much to us. It's our prime source of revenue. It's our prime source of exposure other than these huge quarterly pay-per-views that we build to like all out and Brody Lee's a great champ for us. And this, you know, this match he's got with just a lot of moving parts in the situation the, the, the baby face group with uh, Dustin and QT came out to support Cody. Uh, and then a couple of Cody's friends, Scorpio sky and Matt Cardona, who's an outsider, uh, you know, showing up. I think, that has a chance to be a great match too. And anytime I can see Dustin Rhodes wrestling on pay-per-view, I, I, I'm always happy to see that since I was a small kid. And uh, Cole Cabana in the Dark Order, it's been a great story. So uh, I think there's a lot of great wrestling on the show. Nothing I'm more excited about than MJF versus Moxley for the championship. But really, all the championship matches and that eight-man tag and Bucks versus Jurassic Express, I think they're all strong wrestling matches without really the, the reliance on the stipulations you're talking about, Sean, although there are a few matches on the card that, that have them. Uh, I think uh, you'll see there's going to be a lot of great wrestling, man. All right. Thanks, Tony. You got time for a few more. I got uh, next in line here is Mike Johnson from PW Insider. Mike, you there? Hey, Mike. Mike, you need to unmute your line. All right. Can you guys hear me now? Hey, Mike. Hey, how are you, Tony? Good to talk to you, sir. Um, Great. You brought, up, you brought up the relationship with uh, TNT and Warner Media. What's the status of the second AEW series coming to TNT? Is it still going to be envisioned as AEW Dark, the way it was mentioned a while back by no. Kevin Riley, and how has the relationship between the two sides changed, if at all, with all the shuffling within Warner Media? 
I tried to thanks thanks for asking, uh, Mike. It's it's great, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's funny because I have I I speak to them a lot, and and uh, they've actually I've had texts from from top executives at Warner because we talk so much about promoting the show and about ideas. They actually have texted while I've been on this call with you guys, uh, and um, it's a great relationship. And like I said, it's it's a lifeblood of our company, uh, you know, our media partnership, and. Um, Kevin at the time when he was saying dark, that was not accurate. Uh, we were not going to bring dark as the third hour and, and we had communicated that, but it was a miscommunication. I think Kevin misunderstood some of the materials dark was doing very, very well. And I think is doing very, very well. And dark has actually risen since this conversation we had with Kevin, but, um, that we would do a totally different third hour and keep dark on YouTube. And that is still the plan, and that show will be launched uh, in the next year. Um, I don't have an exact date. I can promise you it will be in the next year, uh, but I don't know exactly when. And uh, there's a lot of work that's going to go into it that still needs to be done in terms of uh, market testing. Uh, you know, there's a lot. It's a, a lot goes into launching a show, and uh, b- before it'll go on network television, we'll we'll have to do all that work and. Um, I think, frankly, as far as going in and doing that market research and uh, putting together a launch plan, the pandemic sidetracked us on that and it made it more difficult. And as far as people developing new shows and working on them, a lot of shows um, have been slowed down. We've been really fortunate that AEW Dynamite has been on through the pandemic and done really, really well and has consistently been around the inner around the top 10 shows. And that was our goal and their goal for us. And uh, I don't know exactly when, but uh, as things are starting to hopefully get more and more normal and as hopefully as the country keeps trending in a better direction, hopefully uh, in terms of going back uh, to work, we'll be, we'll be uh, definitely launching the show soon. I don't know the exact date though, man. And then as far as the relationship to your question, which uh, you asked, yeah, it's, it's, I'm very fortunate uh, that, I, that I met Kevin. I'm glad you gave me a chance to say this and that on the call I can address it because um, without Kevin, there would not be AEW quite possibly. And, uh, I ser- and I'll say that because even when we got to a point where we didn't have a deal and I wasn't sure the show was going to be on TNT, I had gotten far enough down the road um, where – I knew I was going to do this. It was uh, a crazy process. Um, sometimes I see people say, and it's not a bad thing because it's like it's a really important part of our brand. And it's a selling point for what I'm doing this weekend. And this is fitting timing that where it's the two year anniversary of All In now, but it's the one year anniversary of All Out. Um, All In was a hugely important show for the wrestling business. I was going to start a wrestling company before All In. All, if I've seen people say that there wouldn't be AEW without All In, there probably would be AEW without All In, but I don't know if it would have been the same success it was or how it would have gone off. Uh, John Moxley had one of the greatest quotes ever when he described meeting me and how it went and how it could have gone. And he was like, you know, I didn't know him. And like, you know, uh, could he have totally screwed it up? Yes. <laughs> and it was just like, that was like this. Uh, it was like, uh, could have really gotten screwed up, uh, but it didn't, uh, you know, for, uh, our relationship, Kevin, uh, was the guy that for me, he opened a lot of doors. When I went to all in, I wanted to see how it went, but I knew we would be doing a lot of our, we'd be adding a lot and doing a lot of things. And I knew the guys had drawing power. And as far as the show, I I wanted to see a good show, but whether it was good or bad, there was going to be AEW. And, um, for Kevin, I had gone to Kevin in April on effectively a whim, like those moments, like, and it just, it, hopefully it inspires people because like the worst thing people can say to you, if you have a dream is no. And I know I was in a unique position and they effectively like born on third base really. Uh, and, uh, this was my, uh, cliche. I'm sorry if I, if it's a cliche being, you know, this expression, but it's how I feel. I'm very grateful for the position I was in. And then uh, I was able to, you know, effectively get home for us on this uh, by 
going to Kevin and, and making an aggressive move, telling him I wanted to start a wrestling company and that uh, if, if he was going to be bidding on media rights for wrestling, he should talk to me. And I think at first, even though he knew, you know, I had credibility in the world of sports and we're friends, he thought maybe this was completely crazy idea, but he, he humored it. But it wasn't like Kevin just then greenlighted the show. I spent been, like almost a year, really, well, actually over a year by the time we really got there, but, but almost a year before I even had any commitment from them. I mean, he put me in at the ground level with all the marketing and, and media people. And then we got to a point where I wasn't sure that the show was going to be on TNT, but I'd gotten so far down the road before I actually had a deal with them that I needed to do this. I knew now that uh, it was going to be a viable business. I, by December, I had gotten so into the weeds on this that there were a couple different business models and I'd found people were interested in it. It wasn't just, you know, whether I signed with TNT or not, I was going to have a chance to do this and make it a viable business. And I'd already, uh, you know, talked to Chris and talked to people and, 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 and I knew that I could do this. So, uh, you know, for me going back, uh, all in is like a, a great, great achievement in wrestling. It was great, uh, show, but to me, like coming in a year later with all out to be in the same building and to do, to be where I came to their show as their friend and as a fan, and then to be there working together and putting the show together under AEW, it was, it felt really cool. And it felt like we'd come full circle. I was, I'm, I was happy and I was proud of Cody and the Young Bucks. And also I would just want to say, because Mike brought it up, I'm really grateful for Kevin. I don't think, uh, if Kevin, if I hadn't gone up to Kevin, I never would have had the guts to start this company. And the guys might have found another person to work with, and, and it could have been a totally different thing. But I don't think anybody would have made the eight-figure, you know, t tens of millions of dollars commitment uh, into starting a business that we've made. And uh, I don't know what the returns would have been, but I think we've had great returns. And I just don't think I'd be here without Kevin Riley. And I don't think AEW would be here without Kevin Riley or any of us. So I'm really grateful to him. And, uh, you know, it, it, now I think uh, we've got this great relationship and we have a chance to do something really, really special. I never dreamed in my wildest dreams all the years that I wrote Dynamite and Notebooks and dreamed of starting a wrestling company that we would be on TNT because in my wildest dreams, I never, that we never, you know, it's the, the t wrestling would be back on TNT. It's uh, it's like something out of a fantasy for me. And again, like when I talked about how happy I am to be at work with the people I work with, to be on the channel I am, and to work with these people, it's such an honor. Uh, and Warner Media is the is the dream partner for me. Uh, they've been a dream partnership, and because of them, we have a chance. You know, we did all out last year, and it was a big success. Uh, we have a chance for this show to be a great success and a bigger success because of the exposure they've given us uh, over the past year with Dynamite and, you know, to our new new uh, media bosses and the new team, uh, just starting to get to know them. And uh, they have a vision, and I really believe we fit into that vision. I believe that wrestling is some of the strongest streaming content in the world. I believe there are a lot of people who consume wrestling, and I believe that we are a really strong cable property, and that's how we got – that's how we got here. We've built Dynamite up into a top 10 show consistently on Wednesday nights. Uh, I'm constantly thinking about it, retooling it, kicking myself, uh, beating myself up to try and make Dynamite better. And I really believe uh, that if we all put our heads together, that uh, we can make Dynamite the best wrestling show in the world. If, if it's not already, in your opinion, I think uh, we're, working our, we're working hard, but I do think that Warner Media. Uh, I can't say enough about the relationship and I hope that as the company uh, AEW grows and as we get more and more established, we do more and more things together. You guys asked me about the FCW title earlier and I said I, there's things I want to do differently with the FCW title, a different presentation. Uh, I, thankfully, nobody followed up and, and tried to get me to elaborate more details, but, but that's an, one example of different things we're trying to do with Warner Media, and you'll see a lot more projects in addition to Dynamite, which is our flagship show, uh, and our, you know Wednesday night is our, our flagship product, um, 
you'll see a lot more different kinds of shows. In addition to this third hour of wrestling, uh, things that aren't necessarily your classic wrestling show, but I also want Dynamite to feel like your wrestling show. And if there's four times a year going into these pay-per-views where I don't put wrestling, 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 wrestling on, please know that the other 48 weeks of a year, it is the number one concern. And, uh, and, and then for, frankly, I hear you guys on these go homes. Maybe, maybe I should put more wrestling on the go homes and, and, and not be so story driven in the second hour. Uh, and, and I, the worst thing I could do is not listen to what you guys say and the fans say, because they're always right. That's why over the, the, over the holidays, uh, I banged my head and we all banged our heads against the wall so much to come back so strong at the beginning of the year to make sure 2020 was a great year. Uh, that's how I feel about every week now. And, uh, with all out uh, the card that's in front of you guys, I'm really proud of it. I think from a bell to bell standpoint, you'll see. Uh, something that's going to make you guys smile this weekend. I've been waiting for this for a long time. To do Dynamite in front of fans the last couple of weeks has been really special. Uh, and to open it up a little bit more and have a few more fans, but be able to look myself in the mirror and know that we're doing it safely and we haven't uh, risked anybody's safety, whether it's the, the fans themselves or the crew and the wrestlers, to do it, to get that reaction, to get those pops and the dramatic feel and, and the, what we've all been missing. Uh, I'm just so excited for it. And, and I thank you guys for sitting through uh, this call with me and I, I, Jim, I, if, is, do we have any other ones? Uh, this has been so great. I was going to end with one more question. We are at the top of the hour. We are in a time limit, but uh, per custom, uh, we, we normally spin the wheel and, and, and uh, get one more call in and one more question in. And we've done that. So we have time for one more, and the winner is Lewis Gangor from Wrestle Talk. So Lewis, if you're there, uh, we got time to jam you in here for a real quick one. Uh, hi, uh, Louis here from Wrestle Talk. Thank you so much for taking the time, Tony. Hey, thank you. Um, obviously, you guys have done some great work with All Out and the Build. If you look at the card now, and we know, obviously, you guys planned quite far in advance, how much has changed from what you guys planned or from what you thought the all-out card would look like? A lot of it is the same. Uh, the biggest change, I think, I, honestly, it's mostly what I expected. Um, there have been a couple changes. I originally had Britain Swole on the main card, and... Uh, not being sure that Britt Brit hasn't wrestled in a long time. And I think their cinematic match is going to be great. But uh, that was one thing that I changed. And then also um, there, you know, most of it really has been the plan all summer. I think when you look at uh, that, we wanted to do MJF challenging Moxley for the championship that we believed, uh, you know, Kenny and hangman had this great run as champions. And now, uh, we've got uh, arguably the toughest challenge we've ever put in front of them. The number one contenders being FTR uh, that, uh, you know, Matt and Sammy, um, the culmination of their story and Chris versus Orange Cassidy. Um, I think that uh, some challenges, some international challenges changed things up and Thunder Rosa was some ingenuity Kenny threw it out there, and like I said, I have a good relationship with Billy, and when he, he, we were listing names, and Kenny said Thunder Rosa, and I was like, I'll call Billy. It's a great idea. I'd love to do that, and so I booked it, and um, that was a change. Um, some of the names in the Casino Battle Royale, there'd be some people, if, if uh, I had my ways that everybody could be here, uh, that might be a little different, but uh, generally the vast majority of those people are the people I would put in. And honestly, a lot of it's been good, man. There's been people that have come in through the pandemic. Uh, like a uh, great examples would be guys that have gotten signed out of the open challenge, Ricky Starks and Eddie Kingston. Uh, Ricky Starks came in. I didn't plan for this. Uh, Cody had a list of names uh, that he suggested and they were good names. And, at the, the, the Ricky Starks week, Ricky Starks was by far my favorite name on the list, even though I'd never seen him in person and, and had briefly met him once in Texas, but never really spent that much time with him or gotten to know him and uh, had never seen him 
work in person. Uh, he blew me away in his match with Cody. Uh, and I really wanted Ricky to be here. And not only that, but while Ricky was in the ring with Cody, I knew what I wanted Ricky to do. And I has already turned the gears in my head about Ricky being with Taz and about Ricky working with Darby and John Moxley. And uh, before he had even gotten back there. And I thought that was a home run that he hit and that Cody hit with him in what was kind of a tryout match. Uh, and Ricky hit a home run. So that was something I hadn't planned for, for Ricky. And now Ricky's a huge part of AEW and, and a huge part of this casino battle royale. But I didn't expect that necessarily months ago. And also, uh, Eddie Kingston is another one. I've been a fan of Eddie Kingston a long time. And I really enjoy Eddie. I think he's a great wrestler and a great promo. And I'd always thought maybe Eddie Kingston could come in and fit in here, but it just hadn't, uh, I don't know. It, it, I'd never had that one idea click where I was like, that's what we need to do with Eddie Kingston. Cody had a list of guys again, Eddie Kingston. I was like, that's my favorite. That's who I want and, and booked it. And uh, Eddie Kingston, I thought hit a home run. And again, uh, I had an idea for Eddie Kingston. I thought with, uh, you know, pack being gone, uh, there was a great opportunity uh, for Eddie Kingston. We had done this eight-man tag that was kind of a, a great match, I thought. Not kind of, it was a great match, I thought, uh, with FTR and the Young Bucks at Fighter Fest against Phoenix, Penta, and Butcher and the Blade. And we had a fun story going there. And, and it's no secret, we really miss Pac as a company. I really miss Pac. Uh, I think we all do. Um, and, you know, uh, last year when Moxley was unavailable on All Out, Pac stepped up for us and uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate he's not here, but now we have all these other guys on the crew to step up. And um, so, you know, with, with Eddie, I think he can be a mouthpiece for the Lucha brothers, but also we see a lot of moving parts uh, under his leadership with Pena Phoenix and butcher and blade um, and Eddie coming in again, when Eddie did the match and did a great job and, and nailed the promo and, and the reception to Eddie was so good. I thought, okay, well, I think Eddie would be great for this. So we pivoted some stuff and now all five of those guys are, you know, in this casino battle royale and they're a big part of the story. So um, some things have changed there, but the, the main stuff on the card, a lot of it was what we've always wanted to do. And Bucks versus Jurassic Express, I think we felt like could be a great match on the card. Again, two of the top teams and both in the top five and to set up a great challenger, whether, you know, what either team would be a great opponent for Kenny and Hangman or FTR after the title match. So um, it's a great question, man. And um, a lot of it's the same, but, but not all of it uh, is what I would have said months ago. But um, the, the MJF and Moxley and Kenny and Hangman versus FTR, certainly I would have told you a while ago. Uh, and, and Chris versus Orange and Matt and Sammy, I think, um, if that makes sense. All right, Tony. <clears throat> well, um, everybody who's joined us, uh, uh, thank you very much. We're definitely at the end of our time. Um, on behalf of everyone, and, and on behalf of Tony, and, and everyone at, at All Elite Wrestling, a thousand thanks for taking the time today to join us and your continued interest in AEW. Um, as, as we've said in the past, we don't take the commitment to the wrestling industry for granted and be assured it's appreciated, especially this year, a uh, very unusual and eventful year. So we'll be distributing an audio copy of, uh, of the teleconference here with Tony very shortly. So I'll be looking for that. And again, thanks for joining us. And we hope you uh, enjoy all out uh, to, uh, on Saturday night and the entire holiday weekend. Thanks very much. Thank you.